Thanks very much for having me. If anyone has any questions at any point throughout the talk or any, if you want to ask a clarificatory question, if you want to raise an objection, uh, please feel free to interrupt. So I'm going to be talking about principles of chance deference here. And a principle of chance deference says, in really broad outline, given that the objective chance of P is N percent, you should think that P is N percent likely. That is to say, your own subjective degree of belief in P should be N percent. I think principles like these are very plausible, but their plausibility depends in part on a kind of implicit restriction on what kinds of things you get to plug in for P. So here's a counterexample to this principle from John Hawthorne and Maria Lassen and Normio. They say, suppose you've got a lottery with 100 tickets in it, and before the winning ticket is drawn, we decide to name the person who actually wins the lottery lucky. Well, then if we let P be lucky wins and we let N be one, the principle of chance deference says, well, given that the objective chance of lucky winning is 1%, you should be 1% confident that lucky wins. But you know that that antecedent is true. You know for sure that the objective chance of lucky winning is 1%. Uh, so it looks like the principle says that you should be only 1% confident that lucky wins, even though, given the way the name lucky was introduced, it's a priori knowable that if anybody wins the lottery, then lucky does. So it looks like a problem for this principle of chance deference. Principles of chance deference, I think, are uh, one species of a much broader class of principles of expert deference. And they say, well, given that the expert, whoever they happen to be, it could be the objective chances, it could be a weather forecaster, or your doctor, or your future better informed self. Given that that expert thinks that P is in percent likely, you should think that P is in percent likely. And I think all of these principles run into troubles when we consider they say thoughts. So thoughts about who you are or what time it is or where you are located. So let the expert be your doctor and let P be I am sick. And the principle says, well, given that your doctor thinks I am sick is uh, in percent likely, you should think I am sick is in percent likely. But when you think I am sick, you think that you are sick. And when your doctor thinks I am sick, she thinks that she is sick. And there doesn't have to be any connection at all between the truth conditions of your thought, I am sick, uh, and the truth conditions of your doctor's thought, I am sick. And so it looks like in this kind of case too, the principles of expert deference are giving some bad advice. So what makes thoughts like I am sick and lucky wins interesting? is that the truth conditions of those thoughts, what it takes for them to be true, varies depending upon who it is that entertains the thought, when and where they are when they entertain the thoughts, and what the world happens to be like when the thoughts are entertained. And in the philosophy of language and in the philosophy of mind, thoughts like that have been usefully modeled with a two-dimensional semantics. And a two-dimensional semantics, as I'm gonna understand it here, says something about how the truth conditions of your thoughts vary depending upon who you are, uh, when and where you are, and what the world happens to be like. What I'm going to try to do here is I'm going to try to take some of the insights of that two-dimensional model uh, of how the truth conditional contents of our thoughts are determined and use it to amend the principles of expert deference and the principle of chance deference in particular to handle thoughts like I am sick and lucky wins. And just to foreshadow, that emendation of the principles is going to have two parts. The first part is going to be to say, you shouldn't align your credence in P with the experts' opinions about P. Instead, you should align your opinions about P with the experts' opinions about an appropriately chosen surrogate of P. And as I'm gonna develop the view here, that surrogate is going to depend upon uh, an implicit parameter, lambda. Lambda is going to stand for location. So I'm going to pick out the surrogate that I want you to defer to chance about, uh, in part by specifying what your location is. 
And important for that reason, the second component of the emendation is going to be to say, you shouldn't align your opinions with the experts unconditionally. Instead, you should align your opinions with the experts conditional on the value of that parameter. So conditional on who you are, what time it is, and where you are. That's the big picture outline. I'm going to start by saying a little bit more about uh, how I understand these kinds of opinions. Uh, I'm going to call those opinions credences and what I take the arguments of your credences to be. I'm going to call those things thoughts. Then I'm going to introduce principles of expert deference in general and a principle of chance deference in particular and raise two problems for a principle of chance deference. And those are the two problems that I just briefly rehearsed in the introduction, namely that they can't handle cases in which you're deferring to chance about a priori knowable contingencies, and that they can't handle cases in which you've lost track of the time. And then in section three, I'm gonna introduce a two-dimensional way of understanding some of the thoughts that I was talking about in section two, and uh, say a little bit about how to think about locations. And in section four, I'm gonna take the material that I laid out in section three and use it to solve the problem cases that I introduced in section two. So when I talk about credences, I'm talking about the kinds of opinions that you express. Can you Sorry, was that a question? Yes. Uh, Barry had a question. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't see y'all. So if you just uh, shout at me, I'll stop talking. I can't, I think you're still muted, Barry. What, what kinds of things have chances? Uh, well, that's, so that's actually, I think, an important part of the puzzle. I think there's some disagreement about this in the literature, uh, in part because of the puzzles that I'm talking about here, but I think that it's truth conditional contents or sets of metaphysically possible worlds that have chances. Okay. And that's what I'm gonna take for granted in this talk. Okay, I agree with that, good. Okay. Um, so I think the, the kinds of things that I'm calling credences are the opinions that you express when you say things like, Fermat probably didn't have a proof of Fermat's last theorem. A little bit more carefully, I think there's two different ways of understanding what's going on when you say that. It could be understood as a claim about what's objectively likely or as a claim about what's subjectively likely. And when I'm talking about that subjective notion of probability, I'm gonna use the word credence. And when I'm talking about a more objective notion of probability, I'm gonna use the word chance. I'm gonna represent your credences with a function C and you hand this function a thought and it hands you back some number between zero and 100%. I'm going to take for granted that this function is a probability measure, by which I mean that if P is a priori knowable, then it gets credence of 100%. Uh, and if you know a priori that P and Q aren't both true, then your credence in the disjunction of P and Q is equal to the sum of your credence in P and your credence in Q. I'm going to suppose that in addition to unconditional credences, you have conditional credences. Um, and I'm going to suppose that those conditional credences obey the ratio formula, at least in the case where your credence in Q is greater than zero. By the way, throughout the talk, I'm going to throw up lots of conditional credences, and I'm always taking for granted that the thing on the right-hand side of the vertical bar has positive credence. So I'm going to use the word thought stipulatively to refer to whatever it is that you hand this credence function, whatever the arguments of your credence function are. Uh, but let me say a little bit more about how I understand thoughts. So I think it's important that thoughts are not truth conditional contents. And I think that in part because I think it's rational for people to have different credences in thoughts like Mark Twain is clever and Samuel Clemens is clever. Even though those two thoughts uh, are true in exactly the same circumstances. What it takes for Twain to be clever just is what it takes for Clemens to be clever. So those are one and the same truth conditional contents, but nevertheless, I think rational credence in Twain is clever and Clemens is clever can differ. So at least in this respect, I think that your thoughts are more fine grained than truth conditional contents. They're at least not just truth conditional contents. One more complication. 
you might have a view on which when I say I am sick and Beyonce says I am sick, we express different propositions, where by proposition here, I just mean the referent of that clause in English. Maybe you could say something about what truth conditional content means? Oh, I just mean sets of metaphysically possible worlds. So the truth conditional content of Twain is clever is going to be the set of metaphysically possible worlds in which Twain is clever. And since Mark Twain is the very same person as Sam Clemens, there is no metaphysically possible world where Mark Twain is clever without Sam Clemens being clever. Um, right. So uh, you might have that kind of view about propositions where me and Beyonce uh, express different propositions when we say, I am sick. But it's going to be important for me that even if we express different propositions when we say that sentence, and even if when we entertain the thought, I am sick, we end up thereby entertaining different propositions, uh, that we nevertheless entertain those different propositions by way of one and the same thought. And that's going to be important to me because I might not know whether I'm Dimitri or Beyonce. And I don't want it to thereby be the case that I'm ignorant of what thought I'm 50% confident in when I'm 50% confident that I am sick. So just to say, there may be, we may be entertaining different propositions when we entertain the thought, I am sick, but we're doing so by way of one and the same thought. So at least in this respect, uh, if you have this view about propositional, about the the proposition expressed by I am sick. And at least in this respect, thoughts are going to be more coarse grained than propositions. I'm going to assume that in addition to having opinions about whether a coin lands heads or tails, uh, you know, whether you're sick, um, who wins the race, you also have opinions about an expert and what their views on the matter are. So I'm going to use this capital script letter to stand for the expert's probability function. And I'll use just a capitalized letter to stand for some particular probability function. So on the left, this says the expert's probability function is E. And on the right, this says E's probability in P is N percent. Given those two different ways uh, of talking about the expert's opinion, there are two different ways you might want to show deference to the expert. So you might want to say that your credence in P, given that the expert's credence in P is N percent, should be N percent. Or you might want to say, well, your credence in P, given that the expert's entire credence function is E, should be whatever probability E gives to P. These are not, strictly speaking, equivalent. So D2 entails D1, but D1 does not entail D2. Uh, nevertheless, I, I've proven a characterization theorem elsewhere that shows you that the kinds of cases in which D1 and D2 come apart, the kinds of cases where it's possible to satisfy D1 without satisfying D2, are incredibly uh, rare and singular and fragile. And so I don't see any philosophical motivation for endorsing one of these principles that isn't also a reason for endorsing the other. So I think they're not strictly speaking equivalent, but they're equivalent for all philosophical purposes. And throughout this talk, I'm just gonna allow myself to go back and forth between these two different formulations. I think the most, uh, maybe the most famous principle of expert deference comes from David Lewis. And it's Lewis's principle of chance deference. By the way, Lewis has, Lewis's principle goes by the name the principal principle. And what I'm going to be talking about here isn't actually the principal principle, but it's rather something that follows from the principal principle together with conditionalization. And I'm going to take conditionalization for granted in this talk. So uh, with that assumption, Lewis's principle says for any proposition P, and it is important here that I'm talking about propositions and not thoughts. Because for Lewis, Lewis thought that the arguments of your credence function were going to be propositions, which are truth conditional contents or sets of metaphysically possible worlds. For any proposition P, any number N, and any time T, your credence in P 
given that the time t chance of p is n percent should be n percent. Or at least that's so, so long as you lack any information which is inadmissible for the time t chances, or time t inadmissible. And what Lewis meant by inadmissible uh, was evidence about times after t. So, so long as you're sitting around at some time before t, the only way you're going to get information about times after t on Lewis's view is if that information comes by way of some oracle or a crystal ball or a time traveler or something like that. So I'm going to argue here that this principle runs into two kinds of problems. In the first place, it runs into problems with a priori knowable contingencies like lucky wins. Uh, and in the second place, it runs into problems when you've lost track of the time and you don't know what time it is. Let me start with the first problem. And I like the, I like the case of lucky wins that I talked about in the introduction, but it's going to be way more complicated than I need for my purposes. It involves a hundred potential outcomes. Um, and rather than focusing on that case, I want to focus on a simpler case where there are just two possible outcomes. So suppose that we're going to flip a coin and the coin is either going to land heads or it's going to land tails. But before we flip it, we say, let's just call whichever side of the coin actually lands up Beatrice. Then consider the proposition, the coin lands Beatrice up. We're certain in advance that the chance of this proposition is 50%, because the coin's either going to land heads up, in which case B says that the coin lands heads up, or it's actually going to land tails up, in which case B says that the coin lands tails up, and either way, the chance of B is going to be 50%. So when we look at Lewis's principle, if we let P be the coin lands Beatrice, and we let N be 50, it says that, well, your credence that the coin lands Beatrice, given that the chance of the coin land Beatrice is 50%, should be 50%. But you know for sure that the chance of the coin landing Beatrice is 50%. And if you know something for sure, then you can ignore it whenever it shows up on the right-hand side of that vertical bar. So Lewis's principle says that your credence that the coin lands Beatrice should be 50%. Even though it's a priori knowable that if the coin lands any way at all, it's going to land Beatrice up. So it looks like you should be somewhere close to 100% confident that the coin lands Beatrice up. Or your credence that the coin lands Beatrice up should be your credence that the coin lands at all. So this looks like a problem for Lewis's principle, at least if you don't have any inadmissible information. But you might think that there's something with inadmissibility going on here. Maybe that dubbing ceremony gave you some inadmissible evidence. Maybe when we introduced the name Beatrice, we thereby learned something about what was going to happen after the coin flip. Maybe. I think that, that way of diagnosing the problem isn't going to get us very far, unfortunately, because we can generate similar kinds of puzzles without having to introduce new names at all. So I can just say, you know, let the, let, I, sorry, I don't need to introduce the name. I can say, uh, consider the, the thought that the actual winner wins. And I know that the chance that the actual winner wins is 1%, but nevertheless, my credence that the actual winner wins should be 100%. And there are similar kinds of cases where you can, you know, get them going just with demonstratives, like pointing at the coin and saying, this coin lands heads. So I think that even if a dubbing ceremony gave us some kind of inadmissible information, we can generate this puzzle without getting inadmissible information in that way. And you might think, well, maybe we don't have any inadmissible evidence, but maybe there's just something wrong with propositions like the coin lands Beatrice. Maybe these aren't the kinds of propositions we ought to be deferring to chance about in the first place. And I think that's a very promising suggestion. But I want to note that it's a suggestion that Lewis is going to have a hard time taking seriously. And the reason is that for Lewis, the coin lands Beatrice up just is either the proposition that the coin lands heads up, or it's the proposition that the coin lands tails up, 
it's either the set of metaphysically possible worlds in which the coin lands heads up, or it's the set of metaphysically possible worlds in which the coin lands tails up. And so if we say that you shouldn't defer to chance about whether the coin lands Beatrice, then you're going to have to say that you shouldn't defer to chance about one of those propositions. And those look like paradigm cases of the kinds of propositions that we should be deferring to chance about. But here's a more promising suggestion that comes from Wolfgang Schwarz. So Schwarz says, we should take Lewis's principle and we should modify it so that it's no longer about propositions, but it's about something more fine-grained. Without going into the particulars of how, of, of what Schwarz thinks the arguments of your credence function are, let me just call it a thought. So he says, for any thought P and any number N and any time T, your credence in P, given that the time T chance of P is N percent, should be N percent. That is so long as you don't have any inadmissible evidence and so long as that thought P is apt for deference at time T. And this notion of a thought being apt for deference is what's going to allow Schwartz to distinguish between the coin lands heads on the one hand and the coin lands Beatrice on the other. The coin lands heads is going to count as apt for deference, but the coin lands Beatrice is not. So I think Schwartz doesn't say anything about what it takes for a thought to be apt for deference at a particular time. But we can, I think that the following is a nice way of developing the view. We could say a thought is apt for deference at a time t, just so long as the truth conditional content of that thought is not a matter of chance at t. So this is going to tell us that the coin lands Beatrice is not apt for deference before the coin is flipped. or not apt for deference for chances before the coin is flipped. Because before the coin is flipped, it's a matter of chance whether that thought says that the coin lands heads or whether it says that the coin lands tails. On the other hand, that the coin lands heads is going to be apt for deference uh, before the coin is flipped. So I think this is a very promising suggestion, and I think that it does solve the problem with a priori knowable contingencies. However, I think that there's a second problem that arises both for Lewis's principle and for Schwarz's principle uh, that this doesn't help with. And that's a problem that crops up in cases where you've lost track of what time it is. So suppose that you don't know whether it's Tuesday or it's Wednesday, but you think it's just as likely to be Tuesday as it is to be Wednesday. And moreover, you know that right now, the chance of Mudskipper winning, call that M, is 75%. And you know that yesterday, the chance of Mudskipper winning was 25%. So it might be Tuesday and it might be Wednesday. If it's Tuesday, then the Monday chance of M was 25% and the Tuesday chance of M is 75%. If it's Wednesday, then the Tuesday chance of M was 25% and the Wednesday chance of M is 75%. So right now, you think it could be that the Tuesday chance of M is 75% and it could be that the Tuesday chance of M is 25%. And you think those two are equally likely. I think that the thought that Mudskipper wins has to count as apt for deference on Tuesday. It's just like the coin lands heads. We know exactly what it would take for that thought to be true or false before the race is run. And I also think that you don't have any information about the future of the Tuesday chances in this case. I think just to make this crystal clear, suppose that you don't know what day it is, but actually it's Tuesday. And then there aren't any time travelers around, there's no oracles, you don't have a crystal ball. So it's hard to see how you could have come by any information about times after Tuesday. That's what I think we should say about inadmissible evidence here. I think we should say that you don't have any, but you might be worried about this, and I'm going to come back around and consider some objections to this assumption in a bit. But first, let me just show you what follows from this assumption. If we suppose that you don't have any inadmissible evidence, then both Lewis's principle and Schwarz's principle is going to tell us that your credence in M 
given that the Tuesday chance of M is 25%, should be 25%, and your credence in M, given that the Tuesday chance of M is 75%, should be 75%. Of course, you know that the Tuesday chance of M is gonna be 25% just in case it's Wednesday, and the Tuesday chance of M is gonna be 75% just in case it's Tuesday. So we get that your credence in M, given that it's Wednesday, should be 25%. Your credence in M, given that it's Tuesday, should be 75%. And by the law of total probability, that implies that your current credence that Mudskipper wins should be 50%. But this looks implausible to me because right now you know that the current chance of Mudskipper winning is 75%. So it seems to me that you should be 75% confident that Mudskipper wins and not 50% confident. Okay, but let me go back to the objection uh, that I was considering earlier. Maybe you have some inadmissible information about times after Tuesday. Here's an argument you might try to make that you have information about times after Tuesday. You might say, well, you know that if it's Wednesday, then the Wednesday chance of Mudskipper winning is 75%. And it might be Wednesday. And after all, that that thought there, that the Wednesday chance of Mudskipper winning is 75%, that's about times after Tuesday. Absolutely. But it's important to recognize that that's not information that you have. The information that you have is that it's currently, there's currently a 75% chance of Mudskipper winning. And since it might be Wednesday, you know that it might be that the Wednesday chance of Mudskipper winning is 75%. We could try to argue from that to your having some inadmissible information about the future if we appealed to some principle that said, if P is inadmissible, then might P is inadmissible. But we have to reject a principle like that. Just think about a simple case where we're flipping a coin uh, and before it's flipped, that the coin lands heads, certainly inadmissible information about the future, but the coin might lands heads shouldn't count as inadmissible information. Or at least if it does count as inadmissible information, then a principle of chance deference isn't going to be capable of telling us anything interesting. Here's a, a positive argument that we don't have inadmissible information about the future in this case. Suppose you're not keeping track of the time, but I am. And I approach you and I tell you that it's Tuesday. And you, know, you don't forget anything, so you don't lose any information. Well, then I think if you, didn't, if you had information about times after Tuesday, before I told you what day it was, you should still have that information after I tell you what day it is. Because you didn't lose any information, you only gained information. But after I tell you what time it is, your epistemic situation with respect to whether Mudskipper wins is exactly the same as my information. So if you have inadmissible information about whether Mudskipper wins or inadmissible information about times after Tuesday, then it looks like I have to have it too. Uh, but I plainly don't have any inadmissible information about the future. And so I think you couldn't have started off with some inadmissible information about the future either. So I think that's the right thing to say here. But let me just pause and note that I think there's something deeply right about this thought. I think that you shouldn't defer to the Tuesday chances in this case. And I think moreover, the reason that you shouldn't defer to the Tuesday chances in this case is precisely because it might be Wednesday. And if it is Wednesday, then you know that the Wednesday chance is 75%. But I have a very hard time making sense of that idea, which I think is right, in terms of you possessing information which is about times after Tuesday seems to me that you simply don't have any information, which is about times after Tuesday. Uh, so just to summarize, I think that Lewis's principle has difficulties with a prior, a priori knowable contingencies like Coinland's Beatrice up. And I think Schwarz shows us some way of handling, shows us a way of handling those problems. But I think that even Schwarz's principle faces difficulties with the second class of problems that arises when you've lost track of the time. I think it would be nice if we had a principle of chance deference that allowed us to deal with both of those problems at once.
In this section, I'm going to introduce some of the two-dimensional framework and introduce an, I, this idea of a location. And then in section four, I'm going to use that, use the stuff that I've introduced in this section to solve the problems that we just saw. So let me start with the two-dimensionalism. I'm going to illustrate two-dimensionalism just with the example I was using in the previous section, where we're going to flip a coin. But before we do it, we say, let's call whichever side of the coin actually lands up Beatrice. One way of thinking about uh, the content of thoughts is in terms of their truth conditions. So what it takes for them to be true or false. So if I wanted to explain to you the truth conditional content of a thought like the coin lands heads, I could say to you, there are two kinds of possibilities, or two relevant kinds of possibilities. There are possibilities in which the coin lands heads and possibilities in which it lands tails. And the coin lands heads, that's true in the first kinds of possibilities, and it's false in the second kinds of possibilities. And that works well for thoughts like the coin lands heads and the coin lands tails. But it's more difficult to sort of characterize the meaning of a thought like the coin lands Beatrice when you, by doing that, by telling you the circumstances in which it's true and the circumstances in which it's false. Because, well, I don't know whether the coin lands Beatrice is true in the head's possibilities or false in the head's possibilities. If the coin actually lands heads, then it's true in the head's possibilities and false in the tail's possibilities. But if it actually lands tails, then it's true in the tail's possibilities and false in the head's possibilities. And the idea behind the two-dimensional approach to sentences or thoughts like the coin lands Beatrice is that we should build that uncertainty into our characterization of the content of these thoughts. So we should say, well, it could be that the actual world is a world in which the coin lands heads, in which case we're in this row. Or it could be that the actual world is a world in which the coin lands tails, in which case we're in this row. And then if the coin actually lands heads, then the truth conditions of the coin lands Beatrice is something, well, it's true in the heads possibilities and it's false in the tails possibilities. But if the coin actually lands tails, then the coin lands Beatrice is going to be true in the tails possibilities and false in the heads possibilities. And then the difference between a thought like the coin lands Beatrice and the coin lands heads is that while the coin lands Beatrice has this interesting two-dimensional array, while the truth conditions of the coin lands Beatrice varies depending upon what actually happens, the truth conditions of the coin lands heads don't vary depending on what actually happens. Whether the coin actually lands heads or tails, this thought is going to be true in the heads possibilities and false in the tails possibilities. So I wanna mention two things about these two-dimensional arrays. So over here on the left, we have the two-dimensional array for the coin lands heads. And over here on the right, we have the two-dimensional array for the coin lands Beatrice. And the first thing concerns these diagonal entries. And the way to think about the diagonal entries is that they are possibilities that you might actually occupy. You know that you're not actually in a possibility like this, because by stipulation, all the possibilities over here are ones in which the coin actually lands heads and lands tails. And you know you're not in one of the possibilities down here because by stipulation, all of these are possibilities in which the coin actually lands tails and lands heads. Since you know a priori that the coin lands heads, if and only if it actually lands heads, you know that you're in one of these diagonal uh, cells of the matrix. And for that reason, your credences are going to live along this diagonal. And the reason that you should be 100% confident that the coin lands Beatrice is that every cell of this diagonal is one in which the coin lands Beatrice is true. The coin lands Beatrice has a necessary diagonal. 
And the reason you should only be 50% confident that the coin lands heads is that only one of the diagonal cells here is one in which the coin lands heads is true. So I think your credences live along that diagonal, but nevertheless, chances probabilities live along the rows, or at least I'm going to take for granted here that chances probabilities live along the rows. I think, as I said to Barry a little bit earlier, there are other people like uh, Nathan Salmon and Dan Nolan who have responded to these kinds of puzzles by saying that chances attach to something more fine-grained than sets of metaphysically possible worlds or truth conditional contents. But as I understand chance, I think that it's just a brute propensity for the world to develop in a particular way. And so what we mean when we say that the chance of the coin landing heads is 50%, we mean that the world has a brute, brute propensity to develop into a world in which it's true that the coin lands heads and a brute propensity to develop into a world in which it's true that the coin lands tails and the propensities are equal. Uh, so I think this is, this is what I see as the diagnosis of what's gone wrong in our first puzzle. The diagnosis is that our probabilities are attaching to something different than what chances probabilities are attaching to. And the solution should be to find something that we can hand over to chance, which is going to be a, an appropriate surrogate for our thoughts. And the thing I'm going to want to, the surrogate I'm going to want to find is one where it's true in one of the columns of these matrix, just in case the corresponding diagonal entry under that column is true. I'm going to call that the diagonal content of a thought. And the way to think about what a diagonal content says is that it's, it doesn't say P. Instead, it says that P expresses a truth. And it's from your perspective, it's going to be a priori that P, if and only if, P expresses a truth. So from your perspective, there's not going to be an important difference between P and pre, P expresses a truth. But from chance's perspective, they're going to be very different. And to see that, think about these possibilities here. Suppose that actually the coin lands heads. Then these are possibilities in which the coin does not land Beatrice because what it is for the coin to land Beatrice is for the coin to land heads. So these are possibilities in which the coin doesn't land Beatrice. But nevertheless, they are possibilities in which the thought the coin lands Beatrice expresses a truth. If you were to entertain that thought, the coin lands Beatrice, at these possibilities, you would end up entertaining a thought with the truth conditional content that the coin lands tails, and it would be true. So the coin lands, sorry, Sorry, the coin lands Beatrice expresses a truth that is uh, true at both the heads possibilities and the tails possibilities, even though the coin lands Beatrice is only true at the heads possibilities, supposing that the coin actually lands heads. So the proposal or the first part of the proposal is going to be that we shouldn't defer to chance about whether P, we should instead defer to chance about whether P expresses a truth. That's the first part of the emendation. And the second part is going to concern locations. And following David Lewis, let's say that a de dicto thought is a thought that says something about what the world is like without saying anything about who you are, what time it is, or where you are located in the world. So Monday's flip landed heads is a de dicto thought. Beyonce is sick is a de dicto thought. A purely de se thought, on the other hand, says something about, and it's important for people who are familiar with the de dicto, de de dis distinction. I'm not talking about de se here, I'm talking about purely de se. A purely de se thought says something about who you are, what time it is, and where you are, and it doesn't say anything else about the world, and it doesn't say anything stronger. So, today is Monday is a purely de, de sorry, purely de se thought, I am Beyonce is a purely day say. What I want to call a location is going to be a thought that settles the truth value of all of your purely day say thoughts. And I should have said on the slides, it doesn't settle uh, the truth value of any other thoughts. So a location is going to be a thought which describes exactly who you are, 
where you are and what time it is in as rich a detail as your thoughts will permit. So given a thought P and given a location that I'm gonna call Lambda, I'm gonna construct the surrogate that I think you should hand chance in principles of chance deference. And that surrogate is what I'm gonna call the de dicto lambda surrogate of P. I'm gonna write that P sub lambda. And the way to think about it is that it says that when you entertain the thought P at the location lambda, you entertain a truth. So P sub lambda says the thought P expresses a truth when it's entertained at lambda. And here, because I'm talking about P expressing a truth, I'm building in the diagonalization component of the view from the previous section. Now I'm also indexing or relativizing that diagonalized content to some particular location lambda. So now let me take this, the a dicto lambda surrogate of P that I developed in section three and apply it to the case of expert deference. So the counter example in the introduction that I considered to a principle of expert deference was uh, if you plug in I am sick, you get, the, you get the principle telling you that given that your doctor's credence in I am sick is n percent, my credence in I am sick and that they say thought I am sick should be in percent. Um, and my proposal is going to be to replace the they say thought I am sick with the de dicto Dimitri surrogate of I am sick, which is to say the thought Dimitri is sick. And given that my doctor's credence in Dimitri is sick is in percent, my credence in I am sick should be in percent. My credence I'm sick, given my doctor's credence function, should be whatever my doctor's credence function gives, not to I am sick, but instead the Dimitri de dicto surrogate of I am sick. I think that proposal works well in cases where I know that I'm Dimitri, but I might not know whether I'm Dimitri or Beyonce. I think the thing we should say about that case is, well, given that I'm Dimitri, and given that my doctor is in percent confident that Dimitri is sick, I should be in percent confident in the they say thought I am sick. Similarly, given that I am Beyonce and my doctor is in percent confident that Beyonce is sick, I should be in percent confident in I am sick. So just to throw up a bunch of notation, let S be the thought I am sick, let Delta be the location I am Dimitri, let beta be the location, I am Beyonce. And then S sub Dimitri, that is to say, the Dimitri de dicto surrogate of S says that Dimitri is sick. Why? Because that's a thought that is true anywhere in a world, so long as I am sick expresses a truth at the location I am Dimitri, which is, which is to say it's true just in case Dimitri is sick. And similarly, S sub beta says that Beyonce is sick then I think that we should accept two constraints on your credence function. Firstly, or I, sorry, I guess this is me. Uh, we should accept two constraints on my credence function. Firstly, that my credence in I am sick, given my doctor's credence function, and given that I am Dimitri, should be my doctor's credence that Dimitri is sick, and my credence in I am sick, given my doctor's credence function, and given that I am Beyonce, should be my doctor's credence when Beyonce is sick. And in general, I think that we should say, given that the expert's probability function is E, given that you're located at lambda, your credence in P should be whatever probability E gives, not to P, but instead to the de dicto lambda surrogate of P, or P sub lambda. And if we take that general principle of deference and we apply it to the case of chance, we get the principle of chance deference that I want to defend. And that principle says, so long as you don't have any inadmissible information for the time t, your credence in p, given that the time t objective chance function is ch, and given that you're located at lambda, should be equal to chance's probability, not in p, but instead chance's probability 
that when you entertain the thought P at the location lambda, you entertain a truth. So let's go back to the case that I considered in section three. Let B be the thought that the coin lands Beatrice up, where just to remind everybody, we introduce to the name Beatrice as whichever side of the coin actually lands up. Well, then this principle of chance deference says your credence in B, given that CH is the time T chance function and given that you are at location lambda, should be chances probability, not that the coin lands Beatrice, but instead that your thought the coin lands Beatrice expresses a truth at your location. So I think that in this example, the location isn't going to play any interesting role. So we can just suppose that you know exactly what your location is. And we can suppose that you know exactly what the objective chance function is, because after all, you know that there's a 50% chance of heads and a 50% chance of tails, and that's the only relevant feature of the objective chance function here. So then the principle says that your probability for the coin landing Beatrice, or your credence for the coin landing Beatrice, shouldn't be the objective chance that the coin lands Beatrice, which is 50%. Instead, it should be how confident chance is, or it should be the objective chance, that your thought, the coin lands Beatrice, expresses a truth. And chance is 100% confident that your thought, the coin lands Beatrice, expresses a truth, even though it's only 50% confident that the coin lands Beatrice. Another way of putting that is that the world is definitely going to uh, evolve into one in which your thought, the coin lands Beatrice, is true. It's only 50% likely to develop into a world in which the coin lands Beatrice, because, as, because actually, let's suppose the coin lands heads, there's only 50% probability that the coin, that, sorry, that the world is going to develop into one in which the coin lands Beatrice, but it's 100% likely to develop into a world in which your thought, the coin lands Beatrice, expresses a truth. So I said that this only holds so long as you lack any inadmissible information. And you might think, well, in cases where I, uh, I have inadmissible information, the principle is just going to fall silent. I think that's not actually correct. And understanding the ways in which it's not correct is going to point us towards a different understanding of admissibility. So let me explain why it's not correct. Uh, why the principle is still going to constrain your credence, even in cases where you have inadmissible information. I should note, I'm going to take for granted here the principle of conditionalization. So the principle of conditionalization, as I'm going to understand it, says that your credence in P, given anything at all, should be equal to some er prior credence function, given, it's sorry, er prior credence function in P, given anything at all, and your current total evidence E. So let E be the current evidence that you have now. Then this thing, your prior credence function in P given whatever and E uh, should be equal by the ratio formula to your prior credence in P and E given whatever divided by your prior credence in E given whatever. And now I'm gonna apply the principle of chance deference to the numerator and the denominator. Even though you have some inadmissible information, this er prior credence function, it doesn't have any information at all. And so it doesn't have any inadmissible information. So your er prior credence in P and E, given the time T chances and given that you're at lambda, should be uh, the chance of the de dicto lambda surrogate of P and E. And your er prior credence in E, given the time T chances and given that you're at location lambda, should be the objective chance of the de dicto lambda surrogate of E. And then applying the ratio formula again, we get that uh, your credence in P, given the time T chances and given that you're at lambda, should be the time T chances probability for P sub lambda given E sub lambda. And I think that this points us to uh, a better way of thinking about inadmissibility, according to which what it is for your total evidence to be inadmissible 
is for this thing on the right hand side here to just be equal to the chance of p sub lambda. And that'll be so just in case the time t chance of e sub lambda is 100%. So following David Lewis, I was working with an understanding of inadmissibility where what it was for e to be inadmissible, the time t chances, was just for e to be about times after t. I'm going to propose a different way of thinking about inadmissibility. And I should note that things like this have shown up uh, elsewhere in the literature. But it's, it's difficult. Oh, sorry, let me say the thing and then I'll say uh, the caveat. So the different proposal that I want to put forward is one in which E is inadmissible for the time T chances, just in case there's some potential location lambda and some potential time T chance function, such that the chance of E sub lambda according to that function is less than 100%. And here, when I say potential location and potential time t chance function, I'm saying, I mean to say that your current credence for occupying that location is greater than zero. And your current credence for that being the time t chance function is greater than zero. The caveat. Uh, it's difficult for Lewis or Schwarz to say something like this in part because your total evidence in cases where you've lost track of the time is going to include day say information. And it's difficult to make sense of what the chance of I'm in Pittsburgh is, or what the chance of uh, I am Dimitri is, in some way where that's not just going to always be 100%. So there's something, it's, it's because what I'm handing chance here is a de dicto surrogate of that day say thought, that I think it makes sense to say that there isn't a chance uh, that attaches to that de dicto surrogate of the thought. And we can give a characterization of inadmissibility in terms of it. There's another important distinction, I think, between these two different characterizations of inadmissibility. And it's that on the aboutness based criterion of inadmissibility, Inadmissible information doesn't go away unless you've forgotten some information. If you have the total evidence E and that information is about the future and then you learn some new information F, well then E and F is also going to be about the future. That was the thing that I used to argue against the proposal in section three that you had inadmissible information when you lost track of the time. So in that case, I said, if you have information about the future and then you go on to learn that it's Tuesday, you should still have information which is about the future. And interestingly, this property is not true given the uh, independence-based criterion of inadmissibility that I'm offering. It can be that you have the total evidence E, you gain some, it's, and the total evidence E is inadmissible, and then you learn something and the information that you end up with is no longer inadmissible. The information you end up with is admissible. So on this proposal, it can be that your total evidence E is inadmissible, even though when you have the total evidence E and F, it's admissible. And to see how that happens, let me go back to the case of losing track of the time, just to refresh everybody's memory. This is a case where it could be Tuesday, it could be Wednesday, and you know for sure that the current chance of Mudskipper winning is 75%, and that yesterday's chance of Mudskipper winning was 25%. Let tau be the location it is Tuesday, and let omega be the location it is Wednesday. So you know that the current chance of Mudskipper winning is 75%, yesterday's chance was 25%, but you don't know whether you're at location tau or location lambda. Now, given the criterion of inadmissibility that I've offered here, some evidence that you have is inadmissible. The evidence that the current chance of Mudskipper winning is 75% is going to count as inadmissible for the Tuesday chances. And the reason is that the omega de dicto surrogate of that thought is just the thought that the Wednesday chance of Mudskipper winning is 75%. So this thought expresses a truth at omega just in case the Wednesday chance of Mudskipper winning is 75%. And 
sub, the subscript T here, by the way, is supposed to be Tuesday. There's a potential Tuesday, Tuesday chance function, which is not certain of that. The Tuesday chances, uh, sorry, if you're at location lamp, at, I, sorry, if you're at location omega, then the Tuesday chances are not going to be certain of that. It's going to be news to the Tuesday chances that the Wednesday chances are 75% confident if you're at location omega. This counts as inadmissible information given the criterion I've offered. And it's inadmissible because, precisely because you might be at the location omega. But now suppose that you learn that it's Tuesday. At that point, omega is no longer a potential location. And for that reason, the evidence you have that the current chance of Mudskipper winning is 75% will become admissible because there's only one potential location, namely Tuesday, and the information that the current chance of Mudskipper winning is no longer news to the Tuesday chances if you are at that location. If you're at that location, the Tuesday chances already know that the current chance of Mudskipper winning is 75%. So this is a kind of a case where you have some inadmissible evidence starting out, uh, you learn something, you don't forget anything, and you end up without any inadmissible evidence. So I think this uh, solves the two cases that I've talked about in section three. So it explains why you should be 100, or it, it shows that this principle of chance deference should tell you to be 100% confident that the coin lands Beatrice up. And it also tells you that you have inadmissible evidence about the Tuesday uh, chances beforehand. Oh, and also, sorry, I was gonna go through this. Uh, the principle will also tell you that you should be 75% confident it will tell you that that follows from you deferring to the Tuesday chances. Because if you're deferring to the Tuesday chances, well, you'll think there are two potential Tuesday chance functions. One, which gives a 75% probability to Mudskipper winning, and that will be the Tuesday chance function, just in case uh, you're at the location Tuesday. And one, which gives a 25% probability to Mudskipper winning, and that will be the objective chance function, just in case you're at the location, it is Wednesday. And the principle of chance deference says, well, this is not inadmissible relative to the location. Sorry, this is, sorry, you don't have any inadmissible evidence relative to the location it is Tuesday. So your credence that Mudskipper wins, uh, given that it's Tuesday, should just be 75%. Whereas the credence that Mudskipper wins, given that it's Wednesday, should be whatever probability the Tuesday chance function gives to Mudskipper winning, conditional on your inadmissible evidence, or rather conditional on the Wednesday de dicto surrogate of that inadmissible evidence. And the Wednesday de dicto surrogate of your inadmissible evidence just is that the Wednesday chance of Mudskipper winning is 75%. That's news to the Tuesday chances, uh, and I'm gonna suppose that the chances satisfy von Frossen's principle of reflection so that given, given that the Wednesday chance function is 75% confident of Mudskipper winning, the Tuesday chance function is also going to be 75% confident that Mudskipper wins. So then the principle says that whether it's Tuesday or Wednesday, by deferring to the Tuesday chances, you should be 75% confident that Mudskipper wins. So I think that the principle handles those two problem cases that I considered in section three. And now I want to take the principle of chance deference and apply it to uh, an interesting case from the literature, uh, which is the case of Sleeping Beauty. For people who haven't seen the case of Sleeping Beauty before, it goes like this. So on Sunday, we're going to put you to sleep with a powerful sedative. And on Monday morning, we're going to wake you up. Then on Monday evening, we're going to put you back to sleep and we're going to flip a fair coin. And what happens next depends upon the outcome of that coin flip. If the coin lands heads, then we're going to keep you asleep all through Tuesday. And we're going to wake you up again on Wednesday morning. If, on the other hand, the coin lands tails, then we're going to erase all of your memories of waking up on Monday and you're going to be awoken again on Tuesday. So in this case, when you wake up on Monday morning, 
you won't know whether it's Monday or Tuesday. For all you know, you've already been awoken once before and all of your memories have been erased. So for all you know, it's Tuesday and Monday's coin toss landed tails. There's two schools of thought about how you should distribute your credence in this case. The so-called thirders think you should be one third confident that it's Monday and Monday's flip lands heads. One third confident that it's Monday and Monday's flip lands tails and one third confident that it's Tuesday and, Tuesday and Monday's flip lands tails. And one objection to being a thirder, to having this credence distribution, is that it looks like your credences are not matching up with the known chances. It's Monday morning, and you know for sure that the chance that Monday's flip lands heads is 50%. And it doesn't look like you have any inadmissible evidence in this case. It doesn't look like you have any information about the future. After all, there's no oracles about, there's no crystal balls, there's no time travelers. So it looks like you should be 50% confident that the coin lands heads in this case. And so the, others, the other school of thought, the halfers say, you should have this distribution. You should be one half confident or 50% confident that it's Monday and the coin lands heads, and you should distribute your credence that the coin lands pales between it being Monday and it being Tuesday. We apply the principle or the two dimensional principle of chance deference to this case. So let H be the coin lands heads, let U be the location it is Monday, let Pow be the location it is Tuesday. And let's just take for granted that you know exactly what the Monday objective chance function is, call it CH. There's one other thought that I think is going to be important here, which is the thought, I am awake. Importantly, that is something that you know, that's part of your evidence, because after all, that's what rules out the possibility that Monday morning, sorry, the Monday flip landing heads and it being Tuesday. It could be that you're dreaming uh, and that you're asleep on Tuesday. And the information that you have that rules out this square here is that you are awake. Moreover, given the criterion of inadmissibility that I've provided, that information counts as inadmissible for the Monday chances. Because you might be at the location tau, it might be Tuesday. And so it's a potential location. And the Tuesday de dicto surrogate of I am awake, which is I'm awake on Tuesday, uh, is not known to the Monday chance function. The Monday chance function doesn't know whether the coin is going to land heads or tails, and so it doesn't know whether you're going to be awake on Tuesday or not. So the Monday chance that you will be awake on Tuesday is 50%. And so I am awake will count as inadmissible for the Monday chances. Although, of course, relative to the location it is Monday, uh, that information is not inadmissible. The Monday chance function is certain that you're awake on Monday. So here's what the principle of chance deference that I've developed here says about this case. It says your credence that the coin lands heads, given the Monday chance function and given that it's Monday, should be the Monday chance of the de dicto Monday surrogate of heads, given your inadmissible evidence uh, that you are awake, or rather given the de dicto Monday surrogate of that information. You know for certain what the objective chances are, so we can ignore that. And the objective chance function on Monday is certain that you will be awake on Monday, so we can ignore that you are awake on Monday when it shows up on the right-hand side of that bar. And we get the constraint that your credence and heads, given that you're at Monday, should be the objective chance that your thought, the coin lands heads, expresses a truth on Monday. And there won't be any interesting difference between that and the objective chance of the coin landing heads. So the principle of chance deference that I've developed here imposes this constraint on your credences. And this, it turns out, is a very powerful constraint. It's inconsistent with the halfer's position on Sleeping Beauty, because the halfer Sorry. And since the, the Monday chance of heads is 50%, we get this constraint. 
this constraint is inconsistent with the Hafer's position in Sleeping Beauty. Because if you have this distribution, then your credence that the coin lands heads, given that it's Monday, is going to be two thirds, not one half. On the other hand, the constraint is perfectly consistent with the thirders position, because your credence that the coin lands heads, given that it's Monday, according to the thirder, should be 50%. So I think that this principle that we've developed here gives the thirder a response to the criticism that their credences have departed from the known chances. They can say, yes, my credences have departed from the known chances, but that's because I have inadmissible evidence. And that inadmissible evidence is that I've been awoken. That's not evidence which is about the future. So it's not evidence that you would come by from an oracle or a crystal ball or a time traveler, but it is evidence that chance sees as probabilistically relevant to whether the coin lands heads, given that it's Tuesday, and for all I know, it's Tuesday. And so given the criterion of inadmissibility that I've provided here, the thirder has inadmissible evidence. So let me just summarize everything that I've said here. So I think that principles of chance deference have difficulties with thoughts whose truth conditional content varies depending upon who you are, when and where you're located in space and time, and what the world happens to be like when those thoughts are entertained. So they have difficulties with thoughts like the coin will land Beatrice or I am sick. I proposed that uh, we import some lessons from two dimensional modeling thoughts and the philosophy of language and mind. And using that framework, I introduced the notion of a de dicto lambda surrogate for a thought P, given that you're at a location lambda. And that de dicto lambda surrogate says that the thought P, when it's entertained at the location lambda, expresses a truth. When I said we should modify a principle of expert deference, so that it says your credence in P given the expert's credence function, and given that you're at the location lambda, should be whatever probability E gives, not to P, but instead to the de dicto lambda surrogate of P. And when we apply it to the case of chance, that principle says that you should be 100% confident in a priori contingencies like lucky wins or coin lands Beatrice up. It allows you to defer to chance or it gives plausible advice in cases uh, in which you've lost track of the time. It gives plausible advice about how you should defer to chance in cases where you've lost track of the time. And it turns out to be consistent with the thirder solution to Sleeping Beauty, but not consistent with the Hafer's solution to Sleeping Beauty. Thanks very much.